I'm sorry if my voice sounds a bit weird, my throat's really dry. Um, right. Jesus was a non-violent, radical revolutionary who hung out with lepers, hookers, and crooks. They were a person of colour and probably homeless. They may or may not have had romantic and sexual relations with a sex worker who most likely wore a headscarf. They loved dangerously and didn't care what those who thought themselves superior thought. In Romans 13, 9, they said, whatever other command there may be, they are summed up in this command. Love thy neighbour as thyself. Love does no harm to a neighbour and it is the fulfilment of the law. And this command, this golden rule, did not come with a list of ifs or buts. It was inclusive, sweeping, and brought everyone together as one in Christ Jesus. And for a church, a religion that's supposed to be united in one God and a few core beliefs, however basic those may be, we can be a bit useless at working together. We tend to see our differences, be that from denomination or just opinions on some of the finer or less fine points of the Bible, as greater and more problematic than they actually are, making it hard for ourselves to actually achieve anything. For a religion that's supposed to be built on the ideal of equality, it seems odd to me that saying I'm a feminist, someone who's part of a movement that's all about equality, is something that could, should make my faith be questioned, or that this whole marriage equality debate is still even a thing. I feel as a church, as a world, we get so caught up with the speck of dust in other people's eyes, so caught up with being better and being right, that we forget to look at the log in our own eye. We're so obsessed with being right and never getting it wrong that we forget that Jesus died so we could do just that. We could get it wrong. We could make mistakes, ultimately be human and be forgiven for it. We forget that Jesus said that those who are like children will enter the kingdom of God. And children do not judge, whether it's two men walking down the street holding hands or other than asking if they're Batman or a ninja, a woman wearing a bus, on the bus wearing a burqa. And another thing, why are we so obsessed with keeping children so quiet? This attitude leads many, <laughs> leads many parents to feel that they need to leave the church when the child starts crying or even playing too loud. And yes, children crying is annoying, but glaring at a parent only leads to, the pa to said parent feeling ashamed and leaving, therefore preventing them from feeling part of the community and hearing the sermon. We all have our own idea of what a perfect church is. For me, it's filled with beanbags because pews are just uncomfortable. And, lots of, and has lots of tea available at all points. But that's not the point, so credit to my girlfriend Ellie for this next bit. An ideal church shouldn't be a material place, but a place in which people enjoy their faith, expand their faith and feel comfortable around others. We shouldn't limit people's dreams or lives. We're in no place to tell, tell them what they can and can't do. We have no right to control the dreams of people who want to get married but can't. The true ideal church should be one where everyone is accepting of everyone else, no matter what you believe and who you believe in, where everyone throws themselves into everything with a smile. This is how we should aim to build our life and what needs encouraging. Society is, not bro Soci sorry. Society is broken in a way that teaches people that you're either rich or not, white or not, straight or not, male or not, or able-bodied or not. Society makes us feel that if you're born into the nots, then you're in the wrong or set in perpetual disadvantage. As a Christian, it's built into our faith that we should stand for what is right and help those in need. We preach selfless acts repeatedly, but find ourselves not doing them when we leave the church for lunch. If we really want to stand strong and honor our faith, then shouldn't we stand up against the brainwashing of society and show that it's morally wrong? But this doesn't happen because we don't have the funding or we don't have the time in the committee meeting for it to be discussed. Don't get me wrong, saying, oh, but it does happen. You would be correct, but I could also reply with, has it changed anything because a committee meeting in Old Willen mentioned it? The ideal church should allow, and should allow and preach to everyone, those in the right and those in the not. Uh, sorry, this is around. To be an ideal church, people of all ages and walks of life should be able to come along of their own accord, knowing they will have a service that caters for them. A church in which a gay couple could grow up and get married without question. A church where asylum seekers and refugees are welcomed lovingly with open arms and cups of tea. A church where a couple can choose to get divorced without judgment or even not get married in the first place without upturned noses. An ideal church should be rooted in faith and only faith, not rooted in the economic limits of being able to field a new kitchen or carpet. However, somehow over the 19, 1900 years since St Paul first set up a church in Corinth, with the values and teachings of Jesus, those of equality. 
we have somehow been led astray by the tiny details which we make to distract from the real, real issues such as child poverty and slavery, those which Jesus taught against. Before we return to our committees and hold council meetings over the new sink and the ladies' toilet or who uses the bridge, shouldn't we return bearing the message of Jesus and the love and the values of faith and make them the subject of the meeting instead? Why has that been lost? When Jesus went back to heaven, that was our call to continue their work. Their physical form was gone from this world, but that didn't mean the question, that didn't and still doesn't mean the Christian message was over and we could all go sit on our asses. We were called to reach out to others and everyone and tell them about Jesus' love. They called us to be a preacher to their people, whoever our people were and however wrong they were. We were just told to love and that love in all its forms was the only way to heal a broken and hating world. And let's be honest, the world needs a little bit of love now more than ever. We shouldn't be praying against people or groups or even those we consider not right by God. There's the only person who can decide what's wrong or what's right and their name is love, our loving father.